in, in the red. <laughs> this is the word of God for the people of God. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Thanks be to God for his word. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. When I was in seminary, they said that you should pray for something to happen that's not in the bulletin. And many of us in ministry said, please no, Lord. <laughs> Our sermon series and stewardship campaign began two weeks ago as we celebrated what it means to be inserting deep gratitude, remembering that we are called to love God and love neighbor. Last week, we celebrated the widow's might and the widow's might as we are inserting daring gratitude for our discipleship and stewardship. Today, we remember when Jesus shares a sermon on the mount and he talks about storing up treasures in heaven. And so inviting us to ask ourselves, what do we find in our storehouses? The third part of our vision statement is to be a daily disciple. So what does this mean? And how might we insert daily gratitude into the stewardship of our gifts? In that spirit, please join me in prayer. Almighty God, open our ears that we may hear your word. Open our eyes that we may see your glory in our midst. And open our hearts that we might know your spirit's presence with us in these moments. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. If you didn't know, it's Thanksgiving week. <laughs> now, according to AI, there are some top 10 food items in the United States that people expect to have at their Thanksgiving gatherings and feasts. So let's see how many of these you have on your menu, and you can raise your hands. Scalloped potatoes is number 10. Number 9, ham. Number 8 is gravy. 7, Bread and rolls. Six, sweet potato casserole. The sweeter, the better, right? Number five is green bean casserole. Either you love it or you hate it. Wow. Number four, this is for the kids, macaroni and cheese. All right. Number three, mashed potatoes. Yes. Number two is stuffing or dressing. And number one is a Thanksgiving classic, turkey. How many? Now, according to online sources, 46 million turkeys are going to be consumed at Thanksgiving this year. Another, now, other popular food items include corn casserole, honey glazed Brussels sprouts, why? <laughs> Cranberry sauce, and last but not least, pie. Now, good thing we're going to have our Thanksgiving Eve service and pie on Wednesday before Thanksgiving. Now, between now and Thursday, I wonder how we might insert some daily gratitude for the food we eat as well as for our discipleship and stewardship. Our conversation today from the gospel passage is all about priorities. In fact, this is what you and I hear in the Sermon on the Mount. Just preceding our passage, Jesus preaches and teaches about practicing righteousness and how to give to the needy, how to pray, and even how to fast better. Jesus is teaching this in contrast to those who want to show the world their righteousness and piety. Now, these are very difficult conversations because you and I do a lot of things as individuals, and yet we also do a lot of things as a community of faith, the church. We want to celebrate the ways that God is inspiring us to live out our mission and vision statements, right? Just like we want to celebrate the Thanksgiving bag giveaway. But how do we best practice our piety and righteousness with humble hearts? So as you and I approach our focus passage today, not only do we glean information about priorities, we hear a lot about how our treasures are connected with our hearts. Now, it has been said, the things that matter most must never be at the mercy of the things that matter least. That is attributed to Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. He's a renowned German writer and philosopher. 
This quote emphasizes how we must prioritize what is most important in life. So as we dig into what that means, we hear Jesus speaking through the Sermon on the Mount about God's kingdom. I love the way that Je Jesus is going to speak directly to the disciples and directly to the crowds about the things that should matter most. Now, one of the ways that we often approach this conversation about priorities is talking about moments of crisis. Beyond saving your family and pets, what is important to you? For instance, if there's a fire in your home, what things would be devastating to lose? Perhaps it's photos or important papers. In case of a tornado, what items would be so precious to you that you would do everything you could to protect them? Again, maybe it is photographs or maybe it is family heirlooms. Unfortunately, we know people who have gone through these experiences. They've lost homes. They've lost possessions. And we know when, when we say it's just stuff, but it's very human for us to name and to claim these things. I must confess that nearly everything in my home has a story. It's very meaningful to me. I treasure these things, like my teddy bears I shared with the children this summer. An antique clock that was from my grandmother's home. Heirloom furniture pieces that are from Clint's grandparents. And then those things that we've picked up along the way. My guess is that this is true for most of us here. And it probably just isn't one thing that you're thinking of right now, right? Again, our conversation today, though, is about priorities. Our passage from the Sermon on the Mount invites us to seriously reflect on our priorities with God. So the overarching question that you and I face from today's passage is, where is your heart? Now the heart is Jesus' way of talking about that place where we establish commitments and that place where we make decisions, a.k.a. set priorities. Just like we have this physical heart, right, that beats and it, and it governs all of our physical activity, we have a spiritual heart that governs those commitments and decisions that we make. Now, of course, Jesus is deeply concerned with the hearts of those he is speaking to through this message. If one stores up earthly treasures, it affects the spiritual heart. As Jesus was preaching on the value and import of God's kingdom, Jesus does not want anything to hinder one's understanding and desire to be a part of God's kingdom. And Jesus knows that one's possessions can really get in the way. In fact, Jesus seems to be fully aware of the human condition that consumes and collects. Now, we also have to be mindful of the fact that when Jesus first preached this message, the people he was preaching to didn't have a lot of possessions, did they? That's why I believe that these words have so much power for us in our day. Now, of course, we do need some stuff, right? We need food like mashed potatoes and pie this week. We cannot live on, on bread or Thanksgiving food alone, just like the Bible says. We also need affordable shelter, reliable transportation, and thank goodness we need clothing, right? <laughs> Yet the stuff of possessions and wealth cannot save us spiritually. The problem with this kind of stuff is that there's never enough. Now, for many people, collecting something is a hobby. This involves seeking, locating, acquiring, organizing, displaying, storing, and maintaining items. Think about something that you have had the tendency to collect in your lifetime. And exactly how many of those items do you possess now? Now, I have to confess that at one time, I owned over 300 pandas. <laughs> Stuffed ones, ceramic ones, plastic ones, it didn't matter. I started collecting them when I was a child and through my teen years. Pandas of every shape and size. My love of pandas began when I was a little girl. And my passion was fueled by when I went to the San Diego Zoo and I got to see pandas for myself. After having our daughters, though, 
I remember that there was a time I had all of my pandas displayed on an entertainment center, one of those old style entertainment centers. And I remember sitting in front of all those pandas and looking at them and thinking, what am I doing? I started to realize that those pandas were not giving me joy anymore. They weren't bringing me any kind of joy. They began to become clutter to me. So I stored them away, and years later, I moved them on from my life with no regrets. Now, one of the realities that we face is that a life that is focused on physically gaining more is not sustainable. Again, this stuff cannot save us. So friends, there's a reason that it's actually on trend right now to engage in conversations about minimalism. The current state of our world reminds us that, that we may not be the best stewards on earth. We consume product after product, especially those that are disposable and unable to be reduced, reused, and or recycled. Wasn't that awesome? I'm gonna, we're going to hang on to that for a while. But if minimalism is the farthest thing from your mind, and it is for me too, we can still be intentional about the things that we consume. That's why it's so important for us to hear the words of Jesus in verse 19. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy, where thieves break in and steal. I would like for us to get another helping of this from the message translation. Eugene per Peterson titles this, A Life of God Worship, where he reframes what Jesus says. Don't hoard treasure down here where it gets eaten by moths, and corroded by rust, or worse, stolen by burglars. Peterson says, don't hoard. But it just kind of hits us differently, doesn't it? The stuff that we think that is so important here on earth is destroyed by moths and or vermin. But I had to remind myself again, what, what does vermin exactly mean? Vermin are those pests that spread diseases, and they destroy crops and livestock and property. They include rodents, cockroaches, and termites. Ew. Now the stuff that we think that is so important here on earth is appealing to those pests and may also be corroded by rust or even coveted and are stolen by others. Instead of storing up or hoarding treasures on earth, the alternative that Jesus presents is found in verse 20. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. The message says, stockpile treasure in heaven where it's safe from moth and rust and burglars. So what exactly does it mean to store up treasures in heaven? Just like Ms. Leah said, it, it's, it's about our relationship with God. And so how exactly do we store up treasures in heaven? I believe that it means that we have to focus on all of our attention on the things that cannot be destroyed but can remain with us in eternity. Memories, photos fade, yet the pictures in our minds of precious moments remain. Time and energy. We can invest our time in healthy relationships with God and with one another. And the fruits of the Spirit. One can never go wrong focusing on love and joy and peace and perseverance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. These are the kinds of things that keep our hearts in the right place with God. Now, of course, Jesus had this conversation about, about treasures because it was a spiritual issue. Treasures on earth consume more than just earthly resources. Treasures on earth can consume one's heart and even one's soul and shift priorities away from God and Christ and the Spirit. Treasures in heaven, though, put one's priorities in focus with God, Christ, and the Spirit. Charles Spurgeon once said, you must keep all earthly treasures out of your heart. Let Christ be your treasure. Let him have your heart. So what if those who store up for themselves treasures on earth would actually have fewer treasures in heaven? And yet those who recognize that life is more than stuff would receive their heavenly reward. This is best done by getting one's priorities right. 
And I'm not saying that, that our treasures are worthless, right? Because our treasures mean something to us. But our treasures need to be tempered with our relationship with God and how much emphasis we're putting on those treasures. As we insert daily gratitude, we must daily avoid hoarding earthly treasures. We must daily stockpile treasures in heaven. In verse 21, Jesus presents his bottom line. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The message concludes, it's obvious, isn't it? The place where your treasure is, is the place you will most want to be and end up being. And where exactly is this place that we all want to be? We come back to the purpose of the Sermon on the Mount to present that beautiful image of God's kingdom, a present reality for us to get just a little taste of it here on earth, and a future reality when Christ comes in final victory and we all feast at his heavenly banquet. You and I are invited to insert daily gratitude in our discipleship. In terms of the gospel passage, this means to keep gratitude in our hearts every single day. One practice that many find helpful is to start a gratitude journal, to reflect on at least one thing every day in which you are grateful. Of course, this practice is also most helpful when times get tough, because as it has been said, there is always, always, always something to be grateful for. Now, as you and I insert daily gratitude in our stewardship, we need to fast forward a few verses beyond our focus passage. In verse 24, we hear these words of Jesus. No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Some translations say that you cannot serve both God and mammon. This ancient word represents earthly goods, property, and riches. And it's about putting one's trust or reliance in these things. So mammon is where people may put all of their faith and trust in stuff that is actually in opposition to God. Amy Jill Levine notes the irony with this definition, as you and I cannot rely or trust this stuff that we consume and that will consume us. The treasures on earth are those things that we know can be purchased and consumed. Yet the treasures in heaven are those things that are priceless. So Jesus invites those disciples, the crowds, and even us to consider, who are you serving, God or mammon? Obviously, we need to recognize that, that loving God and serving God is supposed to be our number one priority as Christians. Jesus makes it clear that we cannot serve two masters. Essentially, you're going to end up in a, a love-hate relationship with them. Of course, we also know that the bottom line for this is that it is impossible for us to serve both God and money. Now, Jesus was fully aware of what God's people were facing in their day. Oppressive taxes by the Roman government created a very big burden on the people, Yet when Jesus speaks these words, he was aware that there was a spiritual battle with one's possessions. In fact, one's possessions could act actually become like an idol to them. Does this mean that even in Jesus' day, the world was materialistic? Jesus had reason to say these words. Perhaps he saw that even as the people consumed what little they had, they would become less focused on caring for their relationship with God and with one another. So today, these words of Jesus need to speak to our very hearts and minds and souls. These words need to speak to our ability to serve Christ and his church. If God's people then could not serve both God and mammon, then we must acknowledge that we cannot either. And whether we like it or not, our money sets our priorities. The almighty dollar dictates our commitments and decisions, and money certainly can become our focus. In fact, it's been said that if you want to look at one's priorities, all you have to do is look at their pocketbooks. 
Or maybe a modern translation is to say all we need to do is look at our credit card statements or our debit card statements. Where do we spend our money? Is it on important things or frivolous things? And please note that it's okay for us to have fun from time to time, right? Yet we are investing in things to build and grow God's kingdom. Those things that can really make a difference. In this season of Thanksgiving, we have the opportunity to hear the words of Jesus and allow them to sink into our spiritual hearts so that we can be the disciples who insert deep and daring and daily gratitude and whose hearts are always in the right place. Let it be so. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty and gracious and ever-loving God, as we come before you this day, phew, this is hard. Are our hearts in the right place today, God? Are we distracted by our stuff, those earthly treasures and possessions that, that we know ultimately have been given, entrusted to us from you? God, we, we confess that sometimes our stuff does consume us, our minds, our hearts, and our spirits. And God, we want to do better. We want to seek to be more like your son, Jesus Christ, who reminded the crowds and disciples that the treasures that we store up in heaven are eternal. And that is our spiritual goal that we should strive for in our lives. God, we want our hearts to be in the right place. We want our treasures to be with our hearts. So God, inspire us and, and bless us in our journeys of faith and trust. Help us to remember what is most important always. And gracious God, this day, we come alongside those who are grieving this day, those who are hurting the losses they've experienced in this past year, the ache in their hearts for entering into this Thanksgiving week. And God, we also pray for those who have so many things to celebrate. They just want to burst forth the, the birth of new babies, birthdays and anniversaries, gatherings with family and friends. And God, help us to remember this past week the ways that Faith Westwood blessed our community and beyond through the giving of the Thanksgiving bags. But again, Lord, to you be the glory. To you be the majesty. To you be all the praise. Thank you for working through us, through the generosity of this church family. And in advance, God, we, we ask your blessing upon the faith commitments that will be brought forward this day, those that will be filled out online, and those that have already been turned in. God, we thank you and praise you for the acts of faith before you, and the opportunities for this church to serve you in 2025. We bring all of this to you in the name of the one who taught his disciples to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. <laughs> 